Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking Hillary Clinton, who has traveled so much these last six months that she is approaching a new landmark, one million frequent flyer miles. Uh, I count on Hillary uh, every single day, uh, and I believe that she will go down as one of the finest secretaries of state in our nation's history. You know, the State Department is a fitting venue to mark a new chapter in American diplomacy. For six months, we have witnessed an extraordinary change taking place in the Middle East and North Africa. Square by square, town by town, country by country, the people have risen up to demand their basic human rights. Two leaders have stepped aside. More may follow. And though these countries may be a great distance from our shores, we know that our own future is bound to this region by the forces of economics and security, by history and by faith. Today I want to talk about this change, the forces that are driving it, and how we can respond in a way that advances our values and strengthens our security. Now already we've done much to shift our foreign policy following a decade defined by two costly conflicts. After years of war in Iraq, we've removed 100,000 American troops and ended our combat mission there. In Afghanistan, we've broken the Taliban's momentum. And this July, we will begin to bring our troops home and continue a transition to Afghan lead. And after years of war against Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, we have dealt Al-Qaeda a huge blow by killing its leader, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden was no martyr. He was a mass murderer who offered a message of hate, an insistence that Muslims had to take up arms against the West and that violence against men, and women, and children was the only path to change. He rejected democracy and individual rights for Muslims in favor of violent extremism. His agenda focused on what he could destroy, not what he could build. Bin Laden and his murderous vision won some adherence. But even before his death, al-Qaeda was losing its struggle for relevance. As the overwhelming majority of people saw that the slaughter of innocents did not answer their cries for a better life. By the time we found bin Laden, al-Qaeda's agenda had come to be seen by the vast majority of the region as a dead end. And the people of the Middle East and North Africa had taken their future into their own hands. That story of self-determination began six months ago in Tunisia. On December 17th, a young vendor named Mohamed Bouazizi was devastated when a police officer confiscated his cart. This was not unique. It's the same kind of humiliation that takes place every day in many parts of the world. The relentless tyranny of governments that deny their citizens dignity. Only this time something different happened. After local officials refused to hear his complaints, this young man, who had never been particularly active in politics, went to the headquarters of the provincial government, doused himself in fuel, and lit himself on fire. There are times in the course of history when the actions of ordinary citizens spark movements for change because they speak to a longing for freedom that has been building up for years. In America, think of the defiance of those patriots in Boston who refused to pay taxes to a king, or the dignity of Rosa Parks as she sh sat courageously in her seat. So it was in Tunisia, as that vendor's act of desperation tapped into the frustration felt throughout the country. Hundreds of protesters took to the streets, then thousands. 
And in the face of batons and sometimes bullets, they refused to go home day after day, week after week, until a dictator of more than two decades finally left power. The story of this revolution and the ones that followed should not have come as a surprise. The nations of the Middle East and North Africa won their independence long ago, but in too many places, their people did not. In too many countries, power has been concentrated in the hands of a few. In too many countries, a citizen like that young vendor had nowhere to turn, no honest judiciary to hear his case, no independent media to give him voice, no credible political party to represent his views, no free and fair election where he could choose his leader. And this lack of self-determination, the chance to make your life what you will, has applied to the region's economy as well. Yes, some nations are blessed with wealth and oil and gas, and that has led to pockets of prosperity. But in a global economy based on knowledge, based on innovation, no development strategy can be based solely upon what comes out of the ground. Nor can people reach their potential when you cannot start a business without paying a bribe. In the face of these challenges, too many leaders in the region tried to direct their people's grievances elsewhere. The West was blamed as the source of all ills a half century after the end of colonialism. Antagonism toward Israel became the only acceptable outlet for political expression. Divisions of tribe, ethnicity, and religious sect were manipulated as a means of holding on to power or taking it away from somebody else. But the events of the past six months show us that strategies of repression and strategies of diversion will not work anymore. Satellite television and the internet provide a window into the wider world. A world of astonishing progress in places like India and Indonesia and Brazil. Cell phones and social networks allow young people to connect and organize like never before. And so a new generation has emerged. And their voices tell us that change cannot be denied. In Cairo, we heard the voice of the young mother who said, it's like I can finally breathe fresh air for the first time. In Sana, we heard the students who chanted, the night must come to an end. In Benghazi, we heard the engineer who said, our words are free now. It's a feeling you can't explain. In Damascus, we heard the young man who said, after the first yelling, the first shout, you feel dignity. Those shouts of human dignity are being heard across the region. And through the moral force of nonviolence, the people of the region have achieved more change in six months than terrorists have accomplished in decades. Of course, change of this magnitude does not come easily. In our day and age, a time of 24-hour news cycles and constant communication, people expect the transformation of the region to be resolved in a matter of weeks. But it will be years before this story reaches its end. Along the way, there will be good days and there will be bad days. In some places, change will be swift. In others, gradual. And as we've already seen, calls for change may give way, in some cases, to fierce contests for power. The question before us is what role America will play as this story unfolds. For decades, the United States has pursued a set of core interests in the region, countering terrorism and stopping the spread of nuclear weapons, secur securing the free flow of commerce and safeguarding the security of the region, standing up for Israel's security, and pursuing Arab-Israeli peace. 
We will continue to do these things with the firm belief that America's interests are not hostile to people's hopes. They're essential to them. We believe that no one benefits from a nuclear arms race in the region or Al-Qaeda's brutal attacks. We believe people everywhere would see their economies crippled by a cutoff in energy supplies. As we did in the Gulf War, we will not tolerate aggression across borders, and we will keep our commitments to friends and partners. Yet we must acknowledge that a strategy based solely upon the narrow pursuit of these interests will not fill an empty stomach or allow someone 